In case you haven't seen us before, we were here previously doing the Tudor undressing. This time we're going to go backwards. We are going to do the Victorian undressing. My name is uh, Ashley Michelle, but I go by Selena. And this is Phil. He is one of the uh, faculty here at MCC. Yep. Um, in real life, I am an administrative assistant uh, to three vice presidents of a local company here. We are a part of a group called FIRE, which is Friends in Recreation and Education. We started with tutors, which is Henry VIII, um, kind of doing some uh, projects, recreating outfits from portraits that were painted during his time. Then later on, we had a friend that wanted to do a steampunk wedding, and we had no idea what steampunk was. So we started looking into it because she had asked me to coordinate her wedding for her. So in order to do that, I needed to know what I was doing, what I was working with. And in doing that, we found the Victorian stuff. Steampunk is uh, kind of lightly based on Victorian fashion. And I kind of got just sucked into it. And then of course, the people that were doing the Tudor stuff kind of got sucked in along with me. Um, for us, we have gotten the question like, oh, is it Victorian hard? Well, we started with Tudors. Tudor does not have uh, existing patterns, really. There's very, very little as far as actual garments that are still existing. There's not a lot of documentation. So it was that was really hard. So when we came to the Victorian time, it was like, oh my God, this is amazingly easy because we have the, the patterns. We have the magazines that were produced at that time. We've got tons of documentation. There's tons of you know, existing garments uh, in museums and in private collections. In fact, your teacher has uh, quite a few pieces. What we're gonna show you is some of the pieces that we have made in our project. We've tried to make them as close as possible using Victorian methods and Victorian um, materials. Now, obviously there are some things we can't get anymore uh, because they just aren't making them. Uh, there are some things that, while they may be making them, are way out of our price range. Um, however, the good thing is, is that by the time Victorians are coming in, um, we're starting with cottons and things like that, which they're, still widely used or made today they're widely accessible and they're actually pretty you know within our uh, price range for the most part so we're what the happens in the Victor or in the tutor time is that from the hundred years or so that the tutors are in power there's not a lot of change in the clothing there's some differences here and there and we went through a little bit of that in the other video in the victorian times we're talking about an explosion of ideas and, you know, just inventions and just amazing things all together, which what happens with the politics and this explosion of new ideas very much goes hand in hand in what happens with the, the clothing. So you've got three different pieces here. This one here that is kind of Christmassy. That would be our Charles Dickens outfit. Um, I, I made that with the intent of being over the top Christmas. I believe I uh, pretty much uh, did that, a good job of that. Um, but even though the uh, bells and stuff are not necessarily something that I've seen, I just thought they were cute. But this is definitely kind of 1860s. Now, when we're talking time periods, we're gonna, there this isn't like okay this is an 1862 no there's a little bit more fluidity than that so this is kind of generalized when i'm talking dates um and also keep in mind that it's not like once that was done and the 70s or 80s hit that everybody's wearing that it's kind of like today you know older people tend to wear fashions that they're comfortable with from when they were younger that type of thing so you're going to see a lot of these things kind of all happening close to the same time and overlapping. Um, it's going to be the high class, you know, wealthy people that are going to stay with the times. But as you get into the regular people, they're going to be remaking things that they had from before, um, or they're going to just be wearing things that they had. There's not like, okay, at 1862, they stopped wearing this outfit and everybody was wearing that. That's not what happens. But this is about 1860-ish. 
Um, we're talking there's big hoops that are underneath this dress uh, that holds everything out. There's petticoats. We'll show a little bit of that later on. Then you go into, that's the 1860s, 1870s. And then you go into the about 1880s and we're talking this lime green or mint green dress. So what happens is they kind of start deciding, well, we want to do something a little bit different. So there's a, actually a period in between here that they don't have dresses of yet. So this is um, the romantic era. Uh, then you end up with the early bustle, which what happens is they take these long skirts and they start swinging the fullness of the skirt to the back. And so you end up with these long dresses with this big elaborate uh, skirts in the back. And then they decide they get tired of that and they start bringing those skirts in and they slim down the figure a bit. And that's the natural form era. I mean, it's called by different things. I'm using terminology that is per used in a majority of the stuff that we've looked at. Although there are other terms for these things. And so once the natural form happens and they decide, you know what, we want those frills back again. And so they go into the 1880s and you end up with these. And so you still have, there's not the big full skirts that the 1860s had. You've got um, a very slim line skirt in the front. But if you look at the side, you end up with this, this poofed butt. And when we, we're going to undress this one and you're going to see what's underneath holding all this stuff up. But you end up with this big poof butt, but you don't have a wide skirt. But you have all these beautiful drapings that happen in these skirts. And that's very much this late bustle period. And then by the 90s, they decide, you know what? We don't want the bustles at all. They get rid of the bustles and they go into this. This has no wiring in this. The petticoats all have what it's called a horsehair braid that's in the flounces and that holds all this stuff out. But there's no wires in this type of a thing. This is much more um, movable. You're freer in this. There's not cages in there. And by the 90s, you end up with women that are wanting to be physically active outside of the home now. So you end up with the bike craze comes out that's just huge in the 90s. And that ends up with a large um, movement that happens with women's clothing. Now, the reason why we're doing an undressing instead of a dressing is because unlike the Tudor stuff, which was a lot more flexible in the change in a woman's body, um, we were able to get those onto mannequins. Well, with Victorian stuff, the clothing is very body specific. It is very fitted to a, a person's body. Not, I mean, like today's fashions are not at all fitted to us. You know, big t-shirts, big cl oversized clothes, it's not fitted. But we're in the Victorian times, we start seeing at the, towards the end some industrialization and um, you have these large factories that start making clothing. But up until the late Victorians, then you don't end up with that. Everything is made by, at home. Most of it's by hand. Um, and it still uh, is happening by hand, even in the late Victorian, although sewing machines are starting or have come into the homes, but there's still some hand making done. Um, and it's still hand fitted. So we could, because the lady who wears these outfits is not available to come and do a dressing, then we decided it was easier to just dress the mannequin and point some of these things out as we go um, because it took some pinning pins to get her into this. Now, this would have been completely closed and buttoned up, but the lady who wears this outfit is very tiny and we could not get it to do that on the mannequin. Of course, she would have her little gloves. Let's just take these. For the most part, in the 80s, her hair is going to be covered by some kind of hat. Um, in the 90s, you end up with, and especially when you go into the 1900s, into the Gibson girl look, um, you don't end up always wearing hats. Um, it goes more into hair decoration. Um, but one of the things about the inside of this outfit 
is that these seams that are along in here actually have boning in them. And the boning in the bodice is not meant to hold you in. It is meant to hold the outfit straight. So it's more of a support for the clothing, not for the body. And you've got boning that goes along any of these seams that are here or here, not in the center, but any of these kind of curvy seams where you want to keep the fabric flat and straight on the body. Boning in Victorian times is usually like there is some steel coming in. There is uh, still whalebone being used, that type of stuff. Uh, they're not. So when people started first started recreating some of these corsets, they're thinking, OK, this is you know, solidly steel bones, like right up against each other all the way around. And, you know, this whole metal kind of person. As the research is going in and they're actually looking at some of these corsets, they're finding that there might be some that's like that, but it isn't like every single corset is like that. Especially as you get later into the Victorians, you have what's called sporting corsets or swimming corsets. And they have some boning in there, but we're not talking about really overly heavily boned. There is a wide variety of how boning is put into outfits and how much it's there. So, and there are even some that are like, there's some kind of mesh that's in between the bones. It's kind of weird. Um, but if you want more information about um, actual corsets, there's a lady who does a whole series of historical sewing, uh, Bernadette Banner. She actually went into one of the museums and was able to look at some of the corsets and does a great job of looking at specifically those and the variety. Um, there's also a, a website or a Facebook, that's no, a website, I think. It's uh, Foundations Revealed. Um, you have to be a member to get to some of their stuff, but they have a whole bunch of stuff there that is for free. Um, and they've got some great articles if you're wanting more information on that. But there's like an amazing amount of stuff out there. And the, the corsets are beautiful things. Um, we could not get the corset onto this. So this is one that was made for this lady who's wearing this. So she's got this metal busk that's right here in the center and that hooks doo -doo -doo, with these little clips. So what you do to get into this is that you unlace this back as, loo as loose as you can, slide it on, hook the things up in the front, and then you work on tightening it up. Now, unlike the Tudors when we were looking at their stuff, that was a spiral lace. This is a crisscross lace. And you want to start from the top to the center and the bottom to the center because your center is your waist and that's where you want the most pull. Now, for the most part, now we're not talking, there's always going to be the outliers. There's always going to be those movie stars and stuff. Um, these are not meant to like, oh my God, I can't breathe. I'm going to, you know, they're... Working people needed to work. Uh, people needed to do their housework, and they can't do that if they can't move. Now, of course, the upper class are going to be a little different, and they're going to just be needing to look pretty, and so they're going to really do tight lacing. But the regular Joe isn't doing that because they need to move and breathe in them. So when she's wearing this, she's actually pretty comfortable because this was made for her. The biggest thing is, is you need to make sure that it's going to come up on, over your hip and down under your arm in the right places. And that this in pull in for the waist is gonna sit in the right place. If it doesn't, if you try to go and buy something from you know, Victoria's Secrets or something online, then you're, and you put it on, it's probably not going to be very comfortable and you're gonna think, why the heck were people wearing these? Well, they were wearing them that were made mostly for them. They were used to wearing them, so that's another thing. Um, but they could breathe. And there are myths out there about people having ribs removed so that they could wear corsets and things like that. Okay, keep in mind, this is before there's um, the anesthesia. This is before they have antibiotics. the antibiotics. This is before, you know, 
basic modern surgical knowledge. So if somebody was going to have a rib removed, then they're going to have to do this awake and they may not live through it. So the idea of having a rib removed to wear some of these things, there, there really isn't evidence for that. And so kind of just keep that in mind. I mean, if somebody's gonna have a rib removed, this is a huge deal. This is not just something you do. Oh, you know what? I wanna look pretty in my dress. It's a much bigger deal that they're not doing that. What they are doing is padding. There is, you know, you think we have um, padded bras today. We have nothing on what the Victorians did. There, if you can make your shoulders and your hips and bottoms look bigger, it's going to make your waist look smaller. So they have, that's why there's, there's these bum rolls and bustles and pads. Not only did they have them in the skirts, they have patterns where it's kind of like bra stuffing. They're stuffing bras, they're stuffing, there's, especially if you're wearing a corset, um, which I'm not on this one because I can't drive one one. But if you've got your bust up and you've got tight fitting clothing, what you end up happening is in this area, you can't get it to lay flat because your body moves right in here where your shoulder goes. So they actually have these little pads that they stick into the clothing that's in here to keep this filled out so it would stay flat. And so they're padding everything. Now, this is not the chemise that she would be wearing. Um, the chemise that was supposed to go with this outfit did not get packed for some reason, but she would have had a chemise. The chemise would have been worn underneath a corset. Again, you do not wear a corset without having something between you and the corset. Two things, two reasons. One is you want to protect the corset from your body, oils and sweat and things like that. Um, the other thing is, is you wanna protect your body from the corset because the boning that's in there and the, the um, tightening that happens, if you don't have a little padding between you and the corset, you're going to end up with um, sores underneath. For the top part, we're kind of basic. For the bottom part is where the fun happens. So we've got a whole bunch of layers in here. So the first one is gonna be this overskirt. And pull this. And one thing to see is what keeps all those nice, pretty um, pleats and falls in this dress is actually built into the skirt itself. So here you can see that there are um, cording that's put in there that the pleats are pleated up and then they're stitched onto that cording. And that happens here in the middle too. And that makes, flip here, that makes it so that when she takes this off, all these pleats are gonna stay where they need to stay. This poof in the back is gonna stay where it needs to stay. Without all of that foundation underneath, these poofs and, and pleats are not gonna stay. It also helps with, in the Victorian time, or the Tudor time, you had the very heavy velvets and things like that. And so in that presentation, we showed where the pleating that was done in the back of the skirt gave you kind of a poofed butt. Um, and that happens because the fabrics were so heavy. In the Victorian times, especially for a day type of dress like this, they're doing a lot of cottons because the cotton is the new fabrics. And cotton doesn't have the body that a velvet or brocade would have, so it can't hold those poofed butts out. So when they decided they wanted to start doing that, they had to make changes to how they're constructing the skirt. And that is one of the changes. And then of course there's the you know pleats on the waistband. So underneath the overskirt is an underskirt. And that gives you the nice pretty flat, it gives you the nice ruffle in the back. And behind, things out of the way. So this will have not fullness in the front, but it will have all of fullness in the back. And that's where you see all these little pleats. And that's because it's got to make room for the cages and stuff that are underneath the skirt. All right. You're taller than I am. Yep. This is 
is when it helps to have a tall guy here. So, here's where we start getting, you, you see the foundations for that. So this, under, and you're gonna, we'll show this, but there underneath here is what's called a lobster tail um, and that does have some wires in it, but it doesn't give the high poof that she wanted. So she put a pillow in the back. Very period, they had a lot of them. It's just adds just that little bit more to give you that shelf in the back. And it's just a simple tied in the front little pillow. This one I think is just filled with cotton, but they would have been filled with like wool, straw, hay, you know, that kind of stuff. Horse hair sometimes. Horse hair, yeah. So this is our under petticoat. And really what this is there to do is to soften the look of the wires that are gonna be in this bottom thing. It also gives it a little bit of floof on the bottom. That's why there's the ruffle. But again, because we're going for a more slender look, you don't, see, like you'll see here, this is a flat. Whereas on the back, from about this center here, all the way around the back, there's panels that are gathered into here. And that's just to help keep the bottoms of the skirt pushed out a little bit. And it's to give some softness to it because what you don't want to see is the wires. So it's going to take him a minute to get this off. We had to do a lot of pinning to get this to work. But a lot of the underclothing is still going to be white. Um, they, I mean, they had a few other colors, but it's predominantly white. Um, it makes it very easy to clean because white fabrics, you know, you can put bleach and lay them out in the sun and they'll kind of naturally bleach. Um, but we're still using mostly cottons. Um, not a lot of linen. The kind of linen's kind of falling out of favor. It was really big until cotton started taking over um, when we have the invention of the cotton gin and then you have the plantations that are here and cotton ends up being one of the big exports from the United States. And of course they encourage the use of it here and they can do dyeing with it and they can do awesome great things. All right, so this is a lobster tail. It is very flat in front. You see there's no boning or anything there because we're not going for a round look. We're looking for a poofy butt look. And so it's called a lobster tail, as you can see, because it has rib ribs that go along in here. And it's got a little thing, so it kind of does look like a lobster tail or lobsters. And it folds up. So the question we get a lot is how do you sit in these things? Very easy. Because this whole thing pushes up. So when you go to sit down, you just kind of grab the back of your thing and you pull it up and it just kind of naturally will start doing this, this fl floof up anyway. Um, and it's made out of, this is made out of wiring, but it's flexible wiring. So if you ended up sitting down flat, it's still gonna flex a bit. So it's very easy to sit in these. Now, this is what is commonly used today in a lot of Victorian dressing. However, it is by no means the only thing that they had at that time. If you get a chance to look at patents or even interested in that, they have tons of patents out there for different kinds of things, all to make the butt look poofed. They have one that looks like bed springs that are covered in a fabric and they have taken these long springs with fabric covering and they've tacked them to the top here. So you have these long springs that come down here. I mean, there's just some really wild and weird and wacky stuff out there. It's amazing. Um, we use the lobster tail because that is an easy pattern to put together. It's an easy one to fit. Um, there is a company called Truly Victorian. If you are interested in doing any kind of Victorian clothing, they have an amazing uh, pattern um, catalog. They also, and all the patterns come with information about the time frame and when that outfit was worn, some fabric suggestions, that kind of a thing. They also have a very active online community on Facebook. So if you have questions, the lady who come, came out with Victorian patterns, uh, she's actually on there quite often, will answer questions. There's also the Victorian dressmaker that is out of England, I believe, 
Um, she's got a couple of books. Um, she's got, no, she's got one book. She's got a second book that's coming out soon, which I can't wait. Um, there's also uh, American Duchess, if you're looking for shoes. American Duchess is a, a, an American company that makes reproduction shoes, and they do an amazing job. Um, and they have some great videos and stuff too. So I would highly recommend those. But um, this is a truly Victorian. Actually, all of the pieces you're seeing are made out of truly Victorian patterns. Um, they also do this great thing in that they are, you fit your front and you fit your back separately. So especially if you're somebody who has a larger bust, you don't, if you say, okay, well, let's say I have 40 inches around. Well, for someone with a larger bust, most of that inches is going to be in the front part and not the back part. And you, if you're trying to design clothing and make patterns that, and do fitting, you want to keep that in mind because your fitting has to, you need more in front than you do in back. So just saying, oh, it's a 40 inch bust. Okay, well, that'll work for me. Not necessarily. It may not be, too, it may be too big in the back because you don't need it back there. You need it in front. So just fitting things to keep in mind. But this is what's in the inside of this thing. And this panel here is what sits up against your back legs. And that is to keep the hoops from just pushing forward. You need something to, to be up against your back so that it doesn't just you know slide forward. And I can show you a little bit of the inside, but it just has all of these little things here. These little lines are filled with a wire. Now we used um, it's called hoop wire and you can find it now. They had it then too. In fact, if you see some of the pieces that your teacher has, it's a little bit different. It's a little thinner. Um, and the stuff that was from period isn't covered in plastic for the most part. I don't think so. Um, but the hoop wire you get today will be in plastic. It just means it's going to be more durable. So we just use modern hoop wire because that's what we could find. And see, it packs down really nice. This folds up. Throw it in a little plastic container. All right, so then she would be in her chemise. The other thing she would be wearing is split drawers. So this is a pair of split drawers, or you might think of them as bloomers, and they're called split drawers because in the center, they are definitely split. There's a hole in there. So the person who wore this, the first time that she wore this outfit for an all day thing, she wore the split drawers, but she just couldn't go without modern underwear. And she f quite quickly realized when she went to the restroom why you don't do that. <laughs> so she has all now, because that's another question we get quite a bit. It's like, how do you go to the bathroom in these things? You don't take everything off. It takes a while to get on there. Um, but it's with these split drawers, when you like go for the, the, the toilet, they split. And so you can do what you need to do and then you just stand up and walk away. Um, because of this in the middle, you're not having to do that. And they're actually very full, so they're actually very comfortable to wear. And they just hook up on the sides. She has one on each side. She just snaps them on. Yeah. But this is an important thing to have. Um, I cannot stress, and neither can. She wanted me to make sure to stress to everybody that do not try to wear these clothes on a day for an all day thing where you may have to use the restroom without wearing these because otherwise you're gonna have a problem. So this was a modern adaptation. Now they do have them where they have the loop. And the reason why is the loop is that way you can take your hands out and you don't have to worry about it. Especially if you're skating, you fall down, you wanna be able to not lose it. So this has modern adaptation in that there are actually pockets on the inside here there's two pockets, so I can put my wallet on one pocket and my phone in the other pocket, and, <laughs> and there's my purse. And I can still keep my hands warm. But that, that's a modern adaptation. And they actually, a lot of times, they had fur on the inside as well. Uh, this is not real fur, obviously, um, but I just have fleece on the inside. So we didn't have the shirt for her because I'm actually wearing her shirt. So Which way do you want to do this? Up probably have to take it up. Yeah. That's okay. Off with her head. Yes, off with her head. 
So this yeah. is a fun hat to wear. Um, much better than the Tudor ones. I like this one. It has bells on the side for Christmas. Keeps your ears warm. It's great. So in the other skirt, we showed you where there is a bunch of pleating and stuff in the back because that's where the emphasis of the poofing is. For this skirt, they're wanting the poof all the way around. So it has a different list. If you look at the skirt, there's these tiny little pleats that go all the way the entire length of the skirt, or the waistband of the skirt. So there's a couple ways to do this. And they did do it this way. Um, so you can go through your uh, skirt pattern and it's a really, I think there's six yards in this. And you put little dots every quarter inch and then go down and put little dots every quarter inch right underneath the previous ones. And then you go in and you stitch it and then you pull it up. Or you cheat. If you look on the inside, there's a strip of ribbon it was a clear or a, a sheer ribbon that had all these little polka dots on there and it just so happens those little polka dots if you use every other polka dot is a quarter of an inch so we just took the the ribbon sewed it along the top of the um, skirt panels and then we used these dots as marker points and if you see these little pleats are tiny they're tiny little pleats. And that is how you get like six, I think six yards of fabric down to a waistband without, without cutting. This is not cut into um, rectangles, or not rectangles, uh, triangles. They're cut in one long strip. And this has, just like the other one, it has an under petticoat. Um, this has uh, ruffles in there to kind of soften the wires. We're not going to take this all the way off. And then underneath here is the hoop. This hoop actually happens to be a quinceanera hoop that we used um, because it gives you the same, the right shape but it gives you the right bell. The only thing is that quinceanera hoops are too big for this period. So if you want to do that, you just get the, get the hoop. You can see on the inside where you just kind of take a little piece out. You can see where the, the wires are connected. We just kind of snipped what was holding them together and kind of pulled them in um, so that we can sm uh, make that radius a little bit smaller. Um, but that's all that's underneath here. And then of course, you know, she'd be wearing bloomers and chemise and all the rest of that stuff. So this one, what helps this come out is on the bottom is, this is a linen. It needed some weight on the bottom um, and some stiffness. So this is a piece of linen canvas that is just goes up about six inches on the bottom. And that's what those strips on the bottom, those decorative strips, which are correct, but they also, not only do they look pretty, but they help tack down that canvas that's underneath. So I'm wearing two petticoats. However, neither petticoat has any wires. It has, at this junction here, actually at the three pieces, places that you see ruffles, on the bottom is a horsehair braid. Now I'm using synthetic horsehair braid because, well, it's cheap and I could get it. Um, I know that there is real horsehair braid out there. However, it's a little bit pricey. Um, and as many of these dresses as we make, that wasn't a cost that we could use. Um, but it still does the job. And so the horsehair braid is about this wide. It's clear. It's just on those bottoms. And then the ruffles are there. One, because I think they're pretty. And two, because it kind of covers the um, sewing lines. So that's what's underneath, and that, that's all that's. There's two of those that have that horsehair on the bottom, and that's what's holding this out. There's no padding up in here, except for me. Well, a lot of what we've been focusing on has been the women's clothing. 
um, because our group mostly makes the women's clothing. What you can purchase today for women's stuff is um, either very costumey or it's made out of polyester, which is really, really hot. So we tend to make our own stuff. It's made out of cottons and linens. So it's, especially here in Arizona, it's much more breathable. However, for the men's costumes, we actually um, purchase most of them. There's places you can get online. Um, there's a Victorian Emporium. There's a local place in East Mesa, um, the Wild West, Wild West Mercantile. Mercantile. Uh, and that's where we've gotten a lot of our stuff because they can try it on. So we're gonna go through a little bit with the guys. So this is kind of a standard. Uh, obviously he would be wearing a, a coat or a jacket of some sort, um, but it's hot so he, took, he has it off right now. So one of the things to note is that they're always gonna have a little thing for your pocket watch. All the guys are wearing them. Um, if you're going to buy one of these vests, know that these pockets, they're tiny little pockets. They only go down to right here and they're only big enough for pocket watch. Um, but you have to unstitch these to open these pockets up. When you buy them, they're closed. So if he takes the vest off, the big thing is um, the men's pants. They did not, for the most part, have fitted waistbands. And they, were, they wear them much higher than you would think of as pants today. Really, men wear their pants more on their hips rather than their waist. Yeah. And they definitely wore suspenders because this doesn't, this is, I mean, look at this. Oh, yeah. It's, it's pretty big. So, but it doesn't matter because he's got his suspenders on. And they're going to hook here on the front on both sides. And they turn around and then you've got the one that goes into the back. And this is pretty common too, this little tightening thing. It kind of helps tighten up in this area there. So that was one thing, yeah. especially the guys that have gotten involved with And they've with got us. wonderfully deep yeah. pockets. <laughs> Um, the the original button fly because yes. they didn't have zippers back then and uh, you know they're pretty comfortable I've got some of the old style uh, recreations of some of the the shoes sort of that they wore back then um, it varied quite a bit and you know like I said it's it's pretty comfortable the other thing is collars uh, in fact I think I have the button hook over here now, I don't have a traditional collar, but they would have these short little collars, and there would be a little um, little button in the back or a little eye hole in the back, and you would have a separate starched collar that you would then hook in back. This would reach through, grab the button, and pop it through. That would attach the collar, and then you would wrap it in here, put the jacket over it. So you had those nice, big, formal collars, but they weren't actually part of the shirt. They were a separate piece. Um, I've seen a couple people wear them. I, I don't think I could because to me it would just, but they do look very cool. And the collars look very much like what you would think of in a uh, formal business shirt collar. You know, it's just kind of, you know, stiff collar with the little uh, points on it. Um, and part of the reason why making them um, removable is because, especially for men where they have those the beards, um, that scruff hair, it wears on those collars. And so they can change the collars out when they start looking kind of ratty. Um, and they with, could starch them separately. And they could starch them, um, and they didn't have to replace the entire shirt. They're just doing the collars. They did the same thing with cuffs, too. They had removable cuffs that they could put on and off. Yeah. And that's why you have cuff links, because they kind of help get them hooked in there. I and mean, again, it's because your movement on your hands, that's where things are going to get dirty. And so they can take them off, replace them, and not have to replace the whole shirt. Yeah. And the fun part is, if you've ever seen one of the old Bugs Bunny episodes where he's basically messing around with a famous opera singer, and he has the opera singer keep a high note forever, and his clothing starts coming apart, I never understood until this, where his collar just flops out. It's like, oh, they actually used to do that. So Victorian studies have now helped me understand Bugs Bunny better. So where the tutors you see that poofy butt is kind of where you see that. Then you see it carries, it comes back again in the Victorians when you have the bustle periods where you see that poofy butt. Well, the Victorians are still around. Um, now the Victorian stuff has influenced what's called steampunk. And for those of you who aren't aware of what steampunk is, it's a whole, that's a general term for a whole lot of subgroups. There's diesel punk and western punk and, and there's just a whole bunch of stuff. But what it kind of starts with is the idea of an alternate history. 
let's say in the Victorian times, you know, obviously electricity went out and we run our world on electricity. Well, at the same time during Victorians as the electricity was coming in, there was also steam power. So the alternate, the steampunk is that, well, what if electricity didn't win out? What if the steam won out and we were running our lives by steam instead? And so that's kind of like where some of that comes from. Some of the first books are uh, Jules Verne, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Around the World in 80 Days with Phineas Fogg. You know? Yeah, there's a bunch of those. And there are still steampunk authors out there. If you're at all interested in who those authors are, let your teacher know and I can get you um, a list of some of them. There's some great stories out there. But it's, in a, it's a way where modern people are reviving this Victorian fashion. Um, they, now, I tend to do my steampunk with Victorian fashion with a steampunk flair, which meaning like my Victorian skirt or my steampunk skirt is the same cut as this one. But it goes with this whole thought of travel. So it has, you know, all this global and stuff like that. So mine is a, a steampunk uh, explorer. So she has all this Victorian travel. So then my hat has some little, you know, wheels on it and stuff like that. So my take on steampunk is that I am looking at it with, I want to do the historically accurate construction just add that twist where I'm using, like they would never have had this print in Victorian times. But then there's other people have gone, like he, <laughs> his student, he does, are mad scientists. Yes. Dr. So, Ignatius Maximilian Dubois, also known as Dr. I am dubious, <laughs> baby. And uh, oddly enough, this particular one was inspired by a wonderful little online, but you can get the DVD for it, musical with uh, Neil Patrick Harris and several other people called um, Dr. Horrible yes, Sing-Along Blog. Um, and this is apparently based off of a Murphy uh, lab coat and was also used for a short period apparently in one of the Alien films. Uh, but it's apparently an old style coat and it just wraps over and I can wear that over this. I also have uh, a Western duster. You'll see a lot of Western influence because the Western period was heavily influenced by Victorian as well. Um, uh, let's see if I can. So I've got the lab coat, and of course, when I'm more out and about, you can just kind of do the whole. And we got this at Wild West Mercantile. There's a, a store here where you can buy a lot of the stuff, and I felt it just kind of went really well with, with the outfit. Um, and of course, one of the things you do, especially if you're a mad scientist, is you've got gadgets. And some of these are, well, like the, this is an actual, you know, working set of telegraph key and sounder. I don't know if, it might have been the early 1900s and not quite in the 1800s, but pretty close. Um, you also see a lot of folks do the, the Frankenstein movies, you know, where they'll get one of these old uh, key switches. They used to have these up in the attics of a lot of houses, and this would be how you turn the main power off. But this also meant that these were live. So you didn't want to do what I'm doing right now because you've got, you know, actual power going across these. Um, and you see a lot of different things. For Halloween, I found a place, I think it was Pinterest? Mm -hmm. Or was it Etsy? That I, I think I ordered Etsy, it from Etsy. Etsy. Uh, so this is kind of a mixture of medieval times and Victorian times and steampunk because this is a plague mask. Uh, they actually had these. You can see pictures of them. The people going through the Black Death and the rest, uh, the ones who had to wander through, they wore these and they would stuff them with rose petals, rosemary, cotton, uh, not cotton, wool, and other things like that to help. It was mostly to help with the smell of the dead bodies as they were going through. But oddly enough, that acted as enough of a filter that it actually did help protect some of them from getting the bubonic plague. Now, during parts of the period of the Victorian era, um, their gloves were a big deal for men. 
they would actually sometimes have a small room of gloves. And if, if something happened to a guest gloves or somehow they forgot them, it was not unusual for a gentleman to, you know, basically offer up their gloves to a, a pair of gloves so that they, you know, couldn't be seen in public without them. It didn't last for very long, but there was a time where men wore gloves almost more than uh, some of the ladies did. And of course, I've got another more of a writing pair of gloves. There's a lot of different accessories that people get into. Well, they had things like zoetropes, or in this case, it's a recreation of a praxinoscope. And if you can get the angle in a little bit later, you can see that there's basically just a strip of paper, and they did drawings in sequence. And when you spin this, and you look at one of the mirrors here as it rotates, you see that, well, there's a horse running. So you could act, it, act the real ones were a little bit bigger, but they basically had animations. Um, kind of cool. And of course, the, as it's steampunk, you have things that are powered by flame. Now this is a Stirling engine, a little recreation of it. You heat this up here, there's a glass tube that's lubricated with graphite. As it heats up, the air expands, pushes back, some of the air is pushed over here, and as this thing rotates, it gets to be pretty fast. This was not steam, it was just using heated air differences going back and forth. Um, and you'll see people also have little steam models. I've actually got a couple of kits that I have yet to put together. Um, and of course, you'll see a lot of goggles. This is one of the hats that I like to wear. Um, it's almost bulletproof though, it's really heavy leather. <laughs> Oddly enough, I had to order this from a place in India on eBay to get the, the, the one I wanted. Um, but yeah, a lot of people create personas. It's not all black, though there's a lot of it. You almost think like we're, you know, Victorian Goss or something, but I don't see any white face paint or black, uh, well, not much. <laughs> Keep forgetting about steampunk giraffe. Yes. Oh, that's the other thing. There are folks who do um, music in the area. So if you ever look up online, Steampunk Giraffe is a very popular steampunk based band. Uh, Spine has an amazing voice. Um, was it electronic? Just just look it up. It's an, some amazing music out there. Um, there's also a couple of others. Oh, what's something Park. I keep forgetting the name of the group. Uh, but they did a neat variation of Chitty Chitty Bang Bang with a really fun uh, video on it as well. So it's, it's kind of, I mean, you see everything. I've seen a steampunk Mandalorian. I've seen a steampunk Iron Man. Um, this steampunk Wonder Woman I kind of liked, but, you know. <laughs> um, and there's quite a few. And they occasionally, obviously not lately, uh, but they have events. Uh, one of the big ones is the Wild Wild West Con down in old Tucson studios. They get, I mean, other people show up, but the whole group goes there, everybody's dressed up. I mean, I got to help, you know, as a mad scientist, I got to help the League of Supremely Evil Revolutionaries, loser, uh, rob a train a couple times. We kept getting caught, though, <laughs> by the sheriffs, marshals, and undercover good guys, AKA smug. <laughs> Very silly stuff, it's fun. So while the, Victorian stuff happened a few hundred years ago. Um, it, the elements of it are still being used today and you'll still see it. Um, one of the things if you're trying to recreate a Victorian look is pay attention to the details. Um, for example, I mean, the women wore a lot of these high neck thing with these little pins and these ruffles. That's something that happens. Um, the watch that I'm wearing, um, if you look at it closely, it's actually to you would be upside down. But to me, if I want to see what time it is, I'm going to flip it this way and it's right side up to me. However, if it was the other way around, then I'd have to flip it and turn it like this. So um, little things like that. Um, hair is a big thing. You know, wearing your hair just loose and, and flowy is beautiful. However, any time during the Victorian times, women, women, now children are different women are not wearing their hair just free, free and flowing. It's up in curls, there's hats, there's, you know, like this is more of a um, Gibson girl, which is late 1890s, um, early 1900s, where it's very full with the little 
kind of, it's supposed to be messy, thankfully. <laughs> so it, it's supposed to be this messy kind of thing, but it's still up. There's still something being done with the hair. It's not just being left down. Um, for men, you're looking at gloves and um, the canes. A women would be wearing gloves a lot of times as well. So w whether you're trying to recreate a historically pocket accurate watches. look, yeah, pocket watches for men. There's some amazing pocket watches. Um, but the thing is, is that you know, pay attention to details. For the Victorian times, there is plenty of information out there. There is um, a, there was a magazine that was printed by Butterick called the Delineator. Um, you can still get copies today. Um, I have found them on eBay from anywhere between five and seventy-five dollars. Um, if you're going to go that route, be very careful and read the uh, description. Um, because there are a few that is like, oh, hey, I'm going to get a great deal, deal. And then I looked at the description. It was actually only one page out of the magazine. So be careful on that. Um, there are reproductions of the Montgomery Wards and the Sears catalogs. At that time, those c catalogs were like our, our uh, Amazon Prime or our Amazon. Um, you could order houses through Sears and Montgomery Wards. You could all the way down to, you know, a shoe. So you can get those reproduction catalogs now and you can see exactly what they were wearing because you can see what people were purchasing. There's so little change in the Tudors that we wanted to emphasize that there is a huge amount of change in the Victorians. You're talking a shorter time frame for Victorians than you are for Tudors, but a widely different um, change of clothing in a shorter time. Um, there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, you have printing presses that, now of course they had printing presses before, however in the Victorian times they put steam power with them. So the printing presses mean that they can distribute or they can make magazines and newspapers and that gets out to the general public. There's also uh, literacy in the United States is really pushed by the Department of Education and so that includes, you know, means that people are buying magazines. Well, magazines are saying, hey, wait a minute here. If we want to keep them buying our magazine, let's give them something new each time. So then they start putting patterns, especially the delineator, which is from Butterick, which is a pattern maker. That's why they did their magazine, because they wanted to sell patterns. And so there's patterns in there, and you can see the progression of what is being made. They're a little hard to read if you're not used to them, but you can see their actual patterns. Um, and then there's cotton gin comes into play and that means that cotton can be processed very quickly in large scales so that means the cotton fabric production goes way up and the prices go way down. So it means that the fabrics are readily available by to everybody. Um, that, so, and then there's also uh, the whole push to, for women to become physically active outside the home. That happens about the mid 1800s. And then it get it like biking, bikes come into play. Bikes were a huge thing. Um, they changed society. And you know, the bike that you wear to, or that you use to go to class um, because it was the first time that women could actually go anywhere without the help of a male, which caused just random pandemonium because men were just like there if you look at the magazines of the time men are just horrified that oh my god women are wearing bike riding bikes and you know it's going to jiggle their insides around and they're not going to be able to have children because it's going to jiggle things out of place and you know it's just this whole you even thing had some of the older women getting upset about it and, yeah you know. there actually there was a lady who did kind of an around the world bike tour and she's the first woman to do this. She actually came through Phoenix and there is a magazine clipping of when she came through and there, there was a quote by, by a woman who happened to be walking down the street when she saw the lady riding by on the bike and just was so horrified and overcome with just shock that she had to go into the closest store and sit down and rest because she had to get over the horror of a woman on a bicycle. So, I mean, there's just all these things that happen. And of course, bicycles mean you can't bike in that. 
you certainly can't bike in the bustle dress. It's a, little, you, it's a little easier to bike in this, but what ends up happening is that women also for the first time start taking control of their clothing. And they're like, I'm riding that bicycle. I cannot do it in this dress. I'm making something that I can. And they start shortening the skirts. We're not talking mini skirts. We are talking like, gasp, you can see an ankle. But they're not having their plain ankle hanging out there. They're still wearing, you know, their socks go up to their knees and then even worse than the shorter skirts, they're wearing bicycle bloomers, which is basically really big poofy pants that go down below their knee, that the sock comes up to their knee. But oh my gosh, heaven help that women could wear that. So they, and they actually, there's a bunch of um, patents out on how women actually designed their skirts so that when they got off the bike, they could undo things and make the skirt fall flat so you couldn't tell that she had been riding a bike because it was there was places that she wouldn't be allowed into in public if she was wearing bicycle riding outfits so their skirts where you can there's buttons in the in the um, front and you kind of button them into a kind of pants and then when you get where you're going you unbutton the pant part and you button them back together again and you end up with a row of buttons down the front and it just looks like a skirt um, they also had pulley systems on the insides of the skirts where there's a weight at the bottom and they would have a, a cord that would run up to their waist and so they went to get on the bike. They'd pull the cords and then tie them around a button and then they'd ride their bike and then when they were going, they'd untie the button and let the skirts down. So I just, um, last six months, I started doing some research on bicycling and um, women's clothing and it's an amazing what women did to hide the fact that they rode a bike to get someplace. Um, because for some of them, it meant that their life was threatened if they were riding a bike. Um, so they had to cover up that they were doing that. Um, and then there's also hat pins. It's another thing that, so there ends up being a law about the length of a woman's hat pin. Because as women started coming out of the homes and started traveling places, they're wearing these big old hats and they have these hat pins in there. Well, so before this, if a woman is on the street, then her morals are in question. So men felt that it was okay to go up and make inappropriate advances to women that were on the streets. So women started getting longer and longer hat pins so that if a man on a, you know, coach or something came up and harassed her or the trolleys then she could take her hat pin out and stab them so instead of making laws to say no you can't harass the women they made laws to say women you can't wear really long hat pins because well you know you can't protect yourself so there's a lot of uh, what goes on politically that happens that affects our clothing and then a lot of what our clothing does to for po politics as well. And as you get through the Victorians, it was very interesting to see that inner weaving and interplay between those things. Um, it, well, and if you take the women's suffrage movement, um, they use clothing for that as well. Um, they didn't want to do a specific, this is a uniform, because they wanted the women to be able from all walks of life to be involved. So what they did instead in the United States is that if you're going to go on a woman's suffrage march, that you were all white. They didn't care what style it was, just that it was all white. And then you could wear your sash. So you'll see a lot of women's suffrage pictures that the women are all in white. And that's why, is because they're saying that. And that also comes to play in the um, current politics because was it last? Senate, yeah, yeah it was in the Senate that you ended up with a whole bunch of the women senators walked in and they were all in white. The reason why they were in white was as a nod to that women's suffrage movement that wore white then. So thank you very much. If you have any questions on any of this stuff, please let your teacher know. She knows how to get a hold of us and can give you our email address. Um, if once things calm down and we can get back together again, uh, if you're interested in learning how to do any of this stuff or just want some help um, getting started, please go ahead and give us get a hold of us. We're always looking for people that are interested in joining. Um, you do not have to be a sewer in order to do this. We will teach you. We've had people join our group that didn't know how to 
thread and needle. And then we've had other people that have been sewing for 20 years. So we have a wide range of, of skill levels and we kind of help each other out. And then we have some people like Phil who don't sew at all. Um, he just kind of- I have it. sewn, but I don't. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but he helps with a lot of our other stuff. Um, and he definitely helps transport a lot of stuff too. So um, thank you very much for your, your uh, attention and I hope you guys have a great day.